Okay. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much to tuning in to another episode of It's a Black Woman, Yes, I Matter. It's actually the last one of 2020. Uh, I am so thankful and grateful that this year is over. In 2021, we're going to start again. Loving it. I really want to just thank everyone who's been tuning in, who's been so supportive and appreciative uh, since we decided to start this. Uh, I would say this was what, in May or so <laughs> that we decided to, to start um, going live and going virtual. So it's been a, just a beautiful journey. And when I think back and reflect on 2020, the people that I wanted to reflect and think back on were my family, my mother, my sisters, Naima Shude, Tamika. I really appreciate you all. You probably all recognize Everyone on here right now has been a previous guest, um, except for Naima, but you see Naima always in the comments saying welcome and really uh, making sure that we're having a great time together. So I really appreciate that. So let's just think quickly about the year review of It's a Black Woman, Yes, I Matter. We start off by discussing the negative effects that COVID-19 has had on black and brown communities. We've had really engaging conversations around education, We've talked about parenting, we've talked about politics, and as you can imagine, we have a lot more to say. <laughs> this forum is especially important uh, to me as it's an outward virtual and global representation of something that is really central and core to who I am as a person, and that is sisterhood. I am blessed to have so many sister girlfriends around the world, but like I said, I really wanna take the time to end 2020 with my flesh and blood sisters and my mother. I wanna thank you guys so much for being here. When I chose this date, December 26, um, I did not particularly focus in on the fact that this is the first day of Kwanzaa, but what Kismet it is, because the first day of Kwanzaa is dedicated to emoja. And emoja means unity, to strive for and maintain unity in the family, hey, mm -hmm. boop, boop, boop. Uh, community, nation, and of course, within our race as Black people. Wow, so let's start there. Not everyone is as lucky as we are to have such a strong family foundation and to have each other. Um, again, I'm just gonna briefly just look around and see who everyone is. So my left over here is my mother, Dr. Angera Jackson. Then we have Naima Thompson, Tamika Thompson, and then Sharita Thompson. So how do we do it, guys? How do we stay so connected and make sure that our family is so grounded in foundation? So I will go to our matriarch first to answer that question. Hi, everybody. This is a perfect forum to talk a little bit about um, our family uh, and to reflect on 2020, as my daughter said. I think one of the things um, that we instilled very early on was really the importance of a loving and nurturing environment. And I think because of that, it has allowed us to remain connected. So, e connected. so even though there may be physical distance, um, we are always, we have a group text going, um, since COVID started, we've been doing a family Zoom meeting every Sunday without fail. Sometimes some of us get on a little late. Sometimes you may have other things to do, but that has really been a great, great way to stay connected. And in fact, um, within this group chat, if I don't hear from someone within a day or two, if I notice they're not really participating, I'm like, what's going on? How come I haven't heard from you? Just checking in to make sure that everything is okay. So I think, you know, even though we're physically apart, there are ways to stay connected and we feel it in our hearts also. So I don't know, maybe you guys can talk a little bit about, expand upon that a little bit as well. I'll chime in. Um, yeah, I really like the Zoom calls. You know, I feel especially um, grateful that my children are able to participate. My children who are very young, they're four and um, one is almost two. And they just absolutely love seeing everyone and, you know, saying hi. And, um, you know, normally we're, we live in Arizona, so we're removed anyway from, from everyone else. But it's been especially nice to have these weekly calls where they can see everyone um, where normally they probably wouldn't. And um, the kids really like it. I mean, sometimes they're playing and they're doing their own thing, but they like to make an appearance. Anytime they see a video, they like to say hi. 
Um, they're very engaged. And so it's very sweet and, and warming to me to, to see them um, interact and, you know, ask about family members that normally they wouldn't. So it's been a great experience. Yeah, I would have to agree. And I think actually it's interesting because this year, w despite COVID, I think we've actually kept in touch more through the group chat text, through the group chat and through the weekly Zoom calls because I think, you know, in years past, I don't necessarily touch base with everyone as frequently as we do now with those standing weekly calls. So that's been a really nice thing. And I think, you know, something mom that you said earlier really reminded me of that, which at the beginning of COVID, I remember I was talking to a good friend of mine and um, I forget who it was exactly that coined this term, but it was, you know, instead of saying social distancing, physical distancing, because socially we actually are perhaps remaining more connected than ever. Yeah, I think everybody just uh, hit the nail on the head where, with uh, the Zoom call and everything. Um, I really enjoy the Zoom chats. And um, yeah, I really uh, I agree. We have really made it a, a point to stay in contact uh, more so now that the uh, pandemic is here. And yeah, I really have been enjoying um, talking to you guys more and chatting about everyday life and, you know, what we're going to make for dinner that day and all that stuff. So it's been really uh, fun to do that. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll just piggyback off of everything that my sisters and my mother have said. Um, I really have enjoyed how the pandemic, to Tamika's point, has brought us actually much closer, even though we cannot be closer physically. We are definitely, I think, closer um, emotionally. We are more connected on the day-to-day -day than normal. Um, I do want to just say that the group chat that we're in, though, did not just start during the pandemic. It's actually something that we have established, I feel like, for a few years That's now, true. as, as yeah. we have all been adults. We've left the, the the nest as they say um we started this group chat it was my mother actually learned how to call it daughters on the iphone so it was like a chat that was called daughters at first and it was really good and in that chat we say hello um we talk about articles that are, are of interest um we share what's going on in our lives we send pictures and so the reason i'm going to details because you guys can do this at home if you don't already have a group chat with your family or even your friends so your family of of birth or in blood or your family of choice, this is a good way to start and, and be connected in ways that really make sense. So uh, I just mentioned, of course, that this is Kwanzaa. Yesterday was Christmas. Um, and then of course, a few weeks ago was Thanksgiving. So we're completely in the holiday season, right? And while we are on the holiday season, I would love for us to just sort of talk about some controversies over some holidays. Uh, we know that not only has 2020 Ex, you know, been a different year because of COVID and the pandemic and quarantine, but it has really elevated the heightened awareness of Black Lives Matter, the importance of what it's like to be Black here in America. And this actually really talks a lot to some of the family traditions that we historically talk about in the US, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, Columbus Day, July 4th, and how some of these holidays are controversial to uh, Black folk, uh, indigenous people, and you know, brown folks, right? Uh, but yet we continue as a family, we continue to celebrate these holidays, especially Thanksgiving. And I would love for us to just talk about, we talk about all the controversy, but we still love to celebrate the traditions that we grew up with. And I would love for us to talk a little bit about why that's so important for us. Anyone can kick us off. <laughs> I, I'm happy to take this one um, and I'm gonna kind of approach it from a high and a very deep level because it's something that I've been thinking about a lot recently, um, which is yes, to your point, right? A lot of these traditions are rooted in you know American or Western society and sort of all the layers that that might come with, especially when we're talking about topics like Black Lives Matter and just, you know, the history in total um, of race relations, particularly in this country. Um, but something that I've been sort of, um, you know, thinking about and thinking about writing about as well is sort of when we think about these, you know, traditions in the sense of, you know, the, the traditions like how we sort of 
and act them and how that is really sort of an act of service for ourselves and coming together as a community and how that really helps to um, memorialize the people that came before us, you know, and, and sort of our ancestry and those traditions that are passed down, especially when you think about my favorite part of most holidays, any holiday, which is really the food, um, you know, and thinking about like passing down recipes, right, that were told or that were written down and just how that plays into this whole larger narrative of storytelling and, and why, you know, traditions are important despite sort of what their origin story may be, right? You can sort of take those things and, and, cre and create your own story out of it right, still sort of keeping in mind the, the historical context, of course. Um, so that was my, albeit brief, but still, again, I think very, a little bit um, high level uh, understanding of it. I'm, I'll go next. I, I'm actually glad that Tamika went because I, I knew she was gonna have thoughts on it. And uh, I was curious to know, and uh, you know, what she said resonates me because I feel uh, very similarly, you know, I, I think it's very hard um, as a black, as a black person, as a black mother, um, you know, I've actually even struggled with the word try being used by um, non like color people, right. Um, and so, like, for me, there's always this sort of like, historically, how do we right reconcile these events? How do we celebrate and think about the history and think about the people that suffered, um, you know, I think sometimes they do get lost, but I, I do like to think about, especially Thanksgiving, because it's it's actually my favorite holiday and I've, I've gotten a little conflicted about that, but I like to think of it as, you know, being thankful, right? Being grateful for the current things in my life. Um, that is like an ongoing trend. I'm very, like, I think about gratitude all the time and all the things that I am like truly grateful for, right? Like my health, my my children's well-being, your well-being, um, and so I just try to live in those moments and think about those things um, while also like, you know, thinking about our current actions and what we can do right now to make a change, right? A positive change forward so that history doesn't repeat itself. Um, and so I'm very grounded in, in those, um, those ideals, those, you know, those thoughts. And, uh, you know, I think for our children, like we need to be realistic, right? Like we don't need to sugarcoat. We don't need to um, sort of like fantasize about like Thanksgiving, right? Thanksgiving dinner and like all those things like the Indians and and the the pilgrims coming together, right? Where we're taught in elementary school, like we need an like real history, right? Um, and my children will get that, not right now. They're a little too young to understand that, but like understand the suffering of our ancestors and what it means to celebrate today and what it can look like for them. They don't they don't have to celebrate. They can choose what they want to do. Um, but that's how I've chosen to do it. You know, one of the traditions that we started as a family was to go around and say the things that we're thankful for. Um, and I feel like that brings a lot of unity, right, to our family and just, you know, just... Um, even giving like the state of mind of where we are in that moment as an individual. So for me, um, that's, that's what it means. That's how I reconcile those things because it is very difficult as a color of person or a person of color. <laughs> um, I agree with what everybody is saying. Um, I think that when I think about celebrating these holidays, I think about, not so much uh, maybe what most people think about, but I think about, um, you know, I'm a Christian, so I for Christmas at least, I think about the reason for me is that, um, you know, Jesus and, um, you know, just really like being grateful for Jesus and um, not so much the gifts or anything and, uh, you know, um, not so much the gifts, but uh, like, you know, just being with family and having food. And, you know, I feel like, especially being a black family, we uh, get together and we focus on the food, you know, like Tamika was saying and Trudeau was saying, we focus on the food and I just focus on being together with my family and having a good time and really um, just focusing on the family aspect of holidays and, um, 
you know, this year was actually the first year really that I looked up Juneteenth and what that meant. And um, I thought that was really interesting. Um, so I think that in going forward, I'm gonna start celebrating Juneteenth rather than um, the 4th of July. Um, and just really like uh, seeing about like, you know, the black family and, you know, how I can, you know, in my future with my family, hopefully uh, one day, you know, we can celebrate Juneteenth together instead of the 4th of July and stuff like that. So, yeah. When I heard um, Tamika and I, well, all of you guys, but I was thinking about recipes. And <laughs> um, so uh, we're blessed to be down here in the same state. And so is Naima. So we were ending up having Christmas dinner together, which we did potluck style. In fact, uh, so uh, mom normally traditionally does everything, <laughs> but this year she did the main, and then my sister and I we did um, the sides. And but Naima also did sweet potato pie, and there is a history around the sweet potato pie in our family. Um, and so I just I would love for us to just like talk about that really quickly because I think it really says something about the importance of bringing recipes down. It brings us together. We have a laugh. We did our Zoom Christmas call. People were like, "Man, that recipe has really gone through this family." <laughs> You know, um, and so the person who first made the sweet potato pie that all of us fell in love with was Sharita. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's funny. I was I was going to bring it up because it, it does have a you know, it has a history now in our family. Um, and I actually can, you know, sort of remember uh, the or origins per se. But, you know, just a little background on me. When I grew up, I wanted to be a chef. I wanted to cook. And so when I was younger, I, I, li I liked cooking. I was, you know, helping my mom out. I was learning things. I remember, you know, learning how to make scrambled eggs, right? Like that's like your first sort of experience with cooking. And so I think one year I just, I wanted to do something and I'm not a huge fan of like pumpkin pie. I'm not a huge fan of apple pie. Um, so I wanted to do something different. Maybe that's how it came about, right? Um, and my mother's friend, Dr. Isaac actually had, she, she doesn't cook which is actually kind of hilarious about this story. Um, but she had this sweet potato recipe that was super simple. I mean, it is, it's, it's, it's simple, but it is the best sweet potato pie that you will have. Um, and so I made it. And that first year it was a hit and everyone wanted it, you know, want some, and I made more. And then the next year everyone wanted more. Um, and at some point I, um, I wasn't coming back for the holiday because I moved out to the to the West Coast. And so it just became, you know, a little difficult. And so my mom had the recipe and then Naima had the recipe. And then other folks heard about this sweet potato pie recipe. And it now it's in New Orleans. And so it really has sort of made its rounds in our family um, because it's just that good. Um, and actually recently, somehow, you know, in the mix of probably having young kids, I lost my recipe. Now I said it's very, you know, it's a very easy recipe to make, but there's still certain things you want to make sure you get your measurements right. You don't want the pie tasting too sweet. And so I was like on this mission to find the recipe. And luckily my aunt had it because we had shared it with her. Um, and so I was grateful in that moment that, you know, someone had it and now I have it digitized. So Physically, I don't have it printed out, but I have it saved in like my Google Drive, wherever, someplace I can, you know, easily access it um, just for reference. But it, it, you know, it's special knowing that our family now has this tradition of, um, of, of a sweet potato pie, you know, something that we all can enjoy and it's, it's easy to make. So there you have it. Before, before mom says something, just saw in the comments, uh, she did Taffy wants you to share that recipe. So, <laughs> uh, we'll do. Yeah, yeah. Share with friends and family. I think you all uh, spoke very well. And uh, I just want to say uh, it really warms my heart, you know, that you all feel that way. And, um, and, and that, you know, it really emphasizes how important traditions are, you know, as you all pointed out, even though the origins may have been steep and things that weren't so nice to people of color. But I think we can move forward and, uh, and create our own memories uh, and make our own traditions. So um, I, I'm really thrilled about that. And I'm glad that you guys are continuing um, this, this path. 
So mom, I'm glad that you're bringing up a little bit about parenting and <laughs> what you're thankful for in terms of the way that we have turned out. It is clear to anyone who knows us, who can see our personalities that we are four very different, independent <laughs> children. <laughs> and um, you and dad really took the time to raise us to be independent, strong-willed, to follow our own paths. I think people are always shocked and amazed that out of all four of us, none of us have walked the same path, either that you and dad walked necessarily, or we walked the same path at all. We are so distinct and our lives have come to um, such different types of journeys. We'd love to hear a little bit more about why that was important to you. Um, how, how did you do it? <laughs> Give us some secret sauce about um, parenting strong black women. Um, and then helping us all maintain our individual selves while still finding that the community of family to be really important. Well, and you know, I think that's that's sort of um, that's a big question and that's a huge area. But but I think I can summarize a few things. I mean, I already mentioned uh, you know how important a loving and nurturing environment is, and and it you know it's clear that uh, my husband and I were on the same page in terms of the values. Um, that we wanted to instill and to, to raise our daughters with. Um, I think one of the most important things, uh, and you all know this about us, we feel that education is the single most important thing because it is clearly the stepping stone um, to make advances in your life, to do good in the community, to improve yourself. Um, he and I are both from relatively poor backgrounds. Um, but education was our stepping stone to be able to raise our family um, in a way that we did not experience a lot of, but we still had that loving, nurturing environment where education uh, and giving back was still supported, even though we didn't have lots of means. I think the other thing is to be involved in extracurricular activities, because even though education is important, one needs to be a well-rounded person, one needs to learn how to be a team player, and, uh, and I think that being having hobbies and being involved in sports uh, are so important. In fact, you guys were so good at it. Kumara brought up something the other day, which was we had to limit <laughs> how much that you guys could be involved with because I always say it was four of you and two of us. So if you were involved in two or three activities each, that was eight to 12 things that we had to get you to run around to practices, games, and and other sort of appointments, if it was a musical instrument or something, but still it was great fun. And I think that that helps to make a well-rounded person. I think instilling self-confidence is another thing. And that's something that's really hard for women, especially young black girls. That is very, very difficult. But um, again, I think if you keep plugging along and you uh, live and show by example and provide the exposure that helps to foster those things, that that's important. Um, the other thing that I that we did with our children and now I'm doing with the grandchildren is I think it's important you know, we talk about education, but reading. We had books everywhere. And everybody had usually a magazine or something that came in the children's names, if not individually as a group. So you all had subscriptions to magazines or access to things like National Geographic and other magazines and highlights yep. as young children and now the grandkids have the highlights subscription. So I want to also say that in particular with daughters, so it was really a pleasure, sometimes not so much a pleasure, <laughs> <laughs> raising four daughters, but always uh, teaching and um, trying to uh, show them that they need to be independent, as was said, and I think you all are. Um, also demonstrating the importance of philanthropy and giving back, and that doesn't necessarily mean giving in dollars, that means giving of your time, which you have all done. Um, you've all done various things in your communities and, and I'm really thrilled and proud of that. And I always, always said to you, and they will attest to this, always be a leader, not a follower. I mean, I think that you all have great leadership skills and I'm so happy to see that although you walk divergent paths, you all walk wonderful independent paths that your dad and I are very, very proud of. No, thanks, Mom. Yeah, I mean, I can follow up. I I teared up a little bit. I might get emotional just because I was thinking about our childhood and, and really how blessed we were. Um, 
just, you know, I, I think about like, we played in sports, but we, we also were able to just like use our imagination. I remember, um, our house on, on, on Whippany road had such great landscaping and Tamika and I would like constantly be outside and, and running around and then like creating these sports and, you know, thinking about, oh my gosh, I don't know, fan, whatever our fantasies, you know, and, and creating these, you know, um, worlds and just letting us, letting us do things, but also, you know, being very grateful for the fact that we know how to swim, right? Like you, um, you were able to like provide us a camp experiences, like whether we <laughs> had good or bad experiences, right? Um, like really what we felt like was roughing it sometimes um, because we wanted that experience and you allowed us to have it. And then learning that maybe that wasn't so much what we wanted, but um, you know, allowing us to explore, right. And to see what we liked and what we didn't like. Um, you know, I feel, I do feel grateful for those things. And, you know, I think about my children now and, you know, we have books all literally all around the house right now. Um, and the highlights, I'm li literally looking at a highlights magazine now that we've, you know, read with the children and, you know, just their excitement over reading. And, um, you know, I think the part where I was thinking of emotionally, um, you know, I see my son now, he's having some, some learning difficulties. I also had some learning difficulties and it's hard. You try to be for, there for your children. And, you know, the fact that you had three other children that you were responsible for, but also like having to manage like my right educational needs. Um, I can only imagine how difficult that was, but I'm grateful for everything, you know, like as an adult now I'm like reflecting back, like, gosh, they did do a lot. I was doing soccer. I remember ski club. Like my parents must've thought I was crazy when I thought I'm going to do ski club. <laughs> <laughs> like no one, I think Kamar one time went skiing beforehand, but you know, but beyond that, I, I, I'm thinking to myself, like the safety, right? The concerns that you probably had as as a parent, um, thinking, oh my gosh, I'm gonna let my child go skiing. And I, I'm not even quite sure what that means or what the safety is. Um, but you allowed us to do it. And honestly, some of those memories I have, like, I remember dad driving me to ski club in, you know, 5 a.m. in the morning and just having those talks. It really, um, it's not just about the activity, but the time that we spent together truly is, um, it's impactful. So I thank you. Uh, you know, when I was younger, it was hard to think about all the time that you guys were sacrificing. I apologize because it was so hard. It, it really was. I, you guys are both ambitious people. And I really felt resentful uh, because, right, like stay-at-home moms, they were always with their children. Um, but you guys did what you did um, so much so. I apologize. Um, because now as an adult, I'm like, damn, that was kind of mean. <laughs> like, you just don't really, like, you don't, you don't realize as a child how much your parents are sacrificing for you, um, until you're living it. So anyway, I'm going to stop, but anyway, thank you for those experiences. Thank you for making those sacrifices and thank you for, um, knowing that they were important to, to, to develop ourselves. I'm gonna just quickly piggyback off of what I'm thinking about it. Uh, I also recall those, so dad was the person who always took me to go to soccer games on Sundays for the town. So we would always be dry. Mom would take me back and forth to practice, but dad always took me to my soccer games on Sunday. And those were some really special times as well. Dad apparently likes to spend some time in the car with us because as we recall, he drove you all the way to Arizona, Sharita, which <laughs> we love to talk about that. That's like a little family story that happens at almost every holiday. We have to bring it up at some point in time. Um, but I also wanna just talk about like the swimming and something that people may not realize is like my parents, our parents don't know how to swim. It was actually really important for them that we learned a skill that they did not know. Um, why was that so important to you? Like what was, what was, what was the thing that you did put us in camp to make sure. I remember I was three, four years old. Going I fell in the pool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you remember you falling in the pool? <laughs> was that one? We were at a Deer Park day camp in, uh, I believe it was Rockland County, New York. 
yeah, uh, to learn how to swim. <laughs> well, you know, I think for, for you know, your dad and I was important because it was a skill that I was resentful that my parents hadn't exposed me to. There was this fear of drowning. Well, of course, you are at risk for drowning if you don't know how to swim. And we just never had the opportunity. Now, again, you guys grew up being able to go to camp. We had pools. And so that made it even that much more important for us that you knew how to swim. But I felt that it was a lifelong skill that was really important. And uh, and we wanted you to know how to swim. So, yes, you're right. <laughs> I, I kind of want to jump in here um, because... You know, I do. I like to think that we learned how to swim because I fell into a pool when I was very young. Um, but I love to swim now. I feel like a fish in the water and I really connect with water as an element and I'm a water sign. So go figure. Um, and I think like there's a, a good story actually I have about dad and being in a car that for me really um, represents what I appreciate about um, you know, the way that we were raised and the childhood that we were afforded, which was extremely blessed and charmed. Um, but I remember when I was learning how to drive, I was in the car with dad and there was two lights back to back, like very close together. This is like anyone who's familiar with Morristown, New Jersey, it's like right be behind headquarters plaza, kind of. Anyway, the far light was green and the close light was red. And I went right through the light <laughs> and just kept going, totally unaware that I ran a red light. And it wasn't until we were well past the second light that was green that my dad just casually goes, I think you ran a light back there. <laughs> and I say that to say, you know, I have... Um, maybe, you know, different to, to some of my sisters, I've been always very willfully independent. Um, and a lot of you know that I went away for school. I just really like to sort of do things on my own, sort of, um, you know, uh, sort of trod my own path, if you will. If someone told me something couldn't be done or couldn't be done a certain way, I was pretty well set on doing it that specific way. Um, and have always been that way. And they've always, uh, my parents have always provided me the resources and the tools that I need to be able to forge that path. And they've always given me the room and the grace to be able to do things that way, right? Even if they might know that's wrong, they still let me do it and figure it out for myself. And that has been really important, I think, just in terms of my overall growth and development. Um, not just as a child, but even into adulthood and as an individual and thinking about, you know, the sort of professional trajectory that I'm on, which is very not traditional. Um, and that has all, you know, helped to, to um, you know, just buoy my faith that I can do it. So I'll keep mine short and sweet. Um, yeah, my parents have really blessed me and my sister so much. And um, like Sharita, I was not really that appreciative when I was a child. But looking back as an adult, I, they have done so much. Even to this day, they do so much for us and Sharita's children. And um, I'm just really appreciative for you, mom and dad. And um, yeah, like even yesterday was Christmas and I was thinking back on my Christmas is as a, a child and we never, uh, there was almost, a ne ne the only thing that I could think of that we didn't, I didn't get as a child was a trampoline because uh, my mom didn't, didn't want us to break anything, but we would literally get everything that we would ask for. And it was just such good memories as, as children. Um, and I just thank you so much for providing the best childhood that you could have provided us, uh, me and my sisters. And I just have such good memories to, to look back on and think about of my childhood. And even um, as an adult, uh, you know, we didn't have to pay for college. So that was a big thing that, you know, my parents, uh, even into adulthood, they provided so much for us. And I, there's, if I was, if I was to sit here and list off everything that uh, my parents did for me and still do for me, I'd probably be here for an hour just talking about that. So I just, I really am grateful for the 
childhood that I was able to receive. And um, I hope that one day, if Lord willing, if I have children, that I can provide some something similar to what my parents gave to me. So I, re I really am thankful for you. And um, yeah, I ha we had some of the best ch childhood, so. Sorry, and I, I just want to chime in here because um, this conversation has reminded me of something, and I, I wish I'd said it earlier uh, when we were talking about the Zoom calls. But, you know, I'm actually very grateful for the fact that my children have been able to <clears throat> meet and interact with their grandparents. Like, I feel like, you know, sometimes it depends on ages and, and whatnot, but sometimes you don't get that experience or it can be a little bit limited. And so, you know, I'm grateful that my children's childhood will involve their grandparents. And, um, you know, we, we've we talked about the Zoom call that we had yesterday on, on Christmas day. And uh, my grandfather, so their great grandfather was able to make the phone call and, you know, they were able to say hi and interact with their great grandfather. Um, we were hoping to, you know, see him physically in person this year, but obviously, due to COVID-19, we weren't able to do that. So um, I think the summer and then yesterday, we were able to have a, a couple of phone calls. And so it's just been nice to even see that interaction as well. Um, and, you know, hopefully uh, we've recorded some of the calls. And so I just hope my children can can look back on these times and, and, and also be grateful for them. Yeah, excellent. And before my mom wants the final word on this topic, but before we get there, okay. <laughs> um, I do want to just say that, uh, yes, we lived a very charmed, I think Tamika said charmed and blessed lifestyle. But I think the most important thing that we are talking about are experiences and feelings of love and less around the materialistic pieces. And I think those are the pieces that really boo you, boo you us to be who we are, to be independent, to be so thankful and appreciative now as, uh, as adults. Um, and I love the things that Shreda is saying around her children having the ability to, to, to know you and to know dad, but also to know our extended family through those Zoom calls, right? Like um, to know their great uh, aunts and great uncles. Um, and certainly for me, that was part of my experience, especially growing up, yeah. is that I was enveloped in love on both sides of the family um, from my mother's side and my father's side. Um, because I was the first, and so they, you know, people hadn't passed away, yet, you know, so you, you had those experiences that I think were so beautiful and so precious. And I know that, you know, Shrita, Tamika, and I, you guys remember a lot of our extended family too, our grandparents, the, the conversations that we have with our aunts. Some of us are in group chats with our aunts. And so I like to just bring that in too, because it's important, not just our immediate family that we have here, but the extended foundation that we have been able to create and cultivate, um, I think has extended through the generations. And something else that's so beautiful about our Zoom calls is it's both sides of our families, both my mother's side and my father's side, and of course us coming together on those calls uh, on a weekly basis, which is just, I don't know. To me, it's like the best of both worlds. It's, it's beautiful to see that people can do that. Um, and you know, I have lots of friends who are products of divorce and that does not happen for them. And, and they have to like figure out those divisions. Um, and so in that way too, we're also mm -hmm. blessed with that beautiful foundation of love and feeling loved um, togetherness on both sides simultaneously. Ma. Yeah, I just wanted to add, but I'm gonna stick something else in based on what you just said. And that is um, Kumara really has, is very good at forging um, these relationships with friends through sisterhood and and developing and continuing uh, family relationships. She's reached out to distant cousins. In fact, she's visited more of my family and cousins over the past several years than I have. Um, and it's really important to her. And it's I think it's important to all of us to have not only, as she said, the immediate, but also the, the, the sort of far reaching uh, relationships as well. Um, my closing comments were going to be um, you know, I started off talking about, you know, the independence and the nurturing environment and all those things that we did. But also, this is uh, last but not least, is the being grateful and being thankful part, which you all have expressed so beautifully. If there's nothing else, also, uh, one of the other things that I tried to instill in them was to always say thank you. If someone did something nice for you or sent you something nice, and, you know, not necessarily just with a text message, but the importance <laughs> of actually writing thank you notes and sending physical cards. I know we've all gotten caught up in the, the social media and the 
eat everything. And even though I do that as well, I'll do an e-blast of holiday cards and all kinds of things, but I also physically write out cards and send notes. In fact, I send cards to all of you. So, you know, I think those little touches that don't cost you more than a stamp even, just a little bit of your time and a nice thought, just make sure that you do those things and express your gratitude and your thanks and just show a little love to people in very, very little ways. It doesn't cost you anything at all really, to do that. Mom, you're so good at doing that. Uh, not only do you do that so well with us uh, as your children, but our friends, our close friends, get things and get thank you cards and get little gifts from you. And speaking of the importance of having a handwritten card, and this is because I see you in the chats, Mia, so you know I'm going to call you out. Mia sent me a Christmas card. I was like, holla, I got a handwritten Christmas card. This was so nice um, and so thoughtful. And there is something about that personal mm -hmm. touch versus not a text message. I do need to get much better at it. Um, Oftentimes I'm like, am I ever going to get to the level of my mother? Because she's just on a whole <laughs> another level of those personal touches, but um, but just so beautiful. I think Tamika, I saw you trying to unmute. Was that right? Did you ever, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> maybe okay. I just said some stuff. But before we go on, I feel like we're like having such great conversation, but there's uh, one of us who has children, and I would love to hear what some of the things are that you would like to instill in your own children, Sharita, in the next generation of Hopkins. Oh, Sharita, you're not on mute. Oh, sorry. Thanks for that. Um, I, there's so much. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, some of the things that mom has said, you know, I do think it's important. Anthony, my husband and I were on the same page about a lot of things, right? Maybe not necessarily everything, but a lot of things we definitely agree upon. Um, you know, we want our kids to be thankful, right? That is a huge thing, teaching them to be thankful, when to say thank you. Uh, we're just in the sort of basics right now, but to be caring. Um, you know, I've noticed um, even last night, our daughter was rubbing my son's back or son's arm. I, they, were, they were sitting down doing something and she just kind of was rubbing his back, like, you know, in a very nurturing way. Um, and it just, you know, when I see moments like that, or when I see uh, my son, you know, um, being very nurturing or hugging my daughter, um, you know, it sort of warms my heart because I'm like, oh, I'm doing something right. Um, especially at this age, because they're so visual, like you don't even realize what they're watching, like what, what they're seeing you do. Um, that when they um, sort of, you know, emulate that, you're like, oh my gosh, like, where do they learn that from? Um, and you're the constant. So they're learning it from you. If you're ever wondering where your kids learned that word or something, more than likely it's you. Um, so just, you know, self-reflection there, good or bad. Uh, uh, so, so yeah, I, um, you know, and just our son is very imaginative. So for me, like to, uh, you know, sort of explore those things. He seems to have sort of like a musical abilities that neither one of my, my husband nor I have. And so, right, giving him those instruments, one of the Christmas presents that my mother gave him was a, a piano that actually works and he can learn how to play. Um, and just giving him the tools to explore. I feel like, you know, exploratory uh, methods are very important. And so, um, yeah, just, you know, I would say very basic right now, caring, nurturing, uh, thankful, you know, being being able to explore. Our son loves to imagine he's dinosaur, right? Like dinosaurs are his thing. He loves pretending to be a raptor. And so we let him do that and have his fun. Um, because, you know, why should, why, why should we stifle that? Um, and so right now we're just sort of in this, uh, you know, it's important for us to have fun um, because it can bring learning about and it can bring out their personality. So that's what's um, core for us right now. Uh, and uh, learning lessons along the way, right? We're, we're doing speech therapy right now with our son and incorporating the things that he likes so that he um, knows that learning can be fun, right? We don't want it to feel 
like it's a job or something that he has to do. And so we incorporate dinosaurs and trucks and monsters and, you know, all that good stuff so that he can um, use his creativity, use his imagination while he learns. And, um, you know, those have been important things. And then I think, again, you know, I, I alluded to this earlier, I had difficulty growing up um, learning wise. And so I think one of the things my parents just showed me is to have patience, right? Like, you know, especially thinking about my behavior, I'm like, gosh, I really acted out. And I think part of that was because I felt like no one understood me. I mean, literally, they probably did not understand me, um, <laughs> you know? And so I get it when my son gets frustrated um, because, you know, it's hard when no one understands you. And so just having that grace and understanding um, that my parents showed me and just, you know, I think part of that's just like the love, like understanding that it's um, everyone will develop um, on their own. And I think that was the other thing that, like about our childhood, like we are very independent, but like I never, you know, sometimes I, I I'm not going to say I never, but I would say that our parents have made it very evident not to compare ourselves to each other, right? Don't compare yourselves or your situation to someone else's. Um, and I think that is very, it's a very healthy thing to know um, about yourself and like situations. I take that now, especially with mom shaming, um, like you don't know what other people are going through. And so don't ever compare yourself or your situation to others whether it's your sibling, whether it's a stranger, um, be concerned about you and what you're doing and the actions that you can hold. And, uh, you know, I'm going to teach my children those things too. So, um, so yeah, there you have it. Great. Um, so guys, that's parenting like was an advanced AP classes of parenting <laughs> you just got for, for free here. Um, <laughs> So, you know, you heard everyone and all of us, especially my mother, really talk about the importance of learning, um, you know, having books, the importance of education, not just, of course, going to good quality schools, K-12 and your higher ed, but also going out and educating yourself, pursuing your own passions, pursuing your own dreams. Um, and this show is often grounded in the importance of educating yourself um, and using that education to advocate and on behalf of yourself to live your best life. So I would love for us um, to discuss what are our career entrepreneurial journeys? What have we taken from our education and applied it into what we're doing now um, with our lives, the stage of our lives that, that's going on? Um, let's see, who would like to go first? I can start. Um, so I would say the biggest takeaway for me, and this is all of my education combined, um, is I'm really grateful for, and the gratitude is really key, right? So I'm really happy that Sharita mentioned that earlier because I really feel like gratitude is like a prayer for what you want to bring in. Um, but what I'm most grateful for, right, is I think um, my ability to think, right, to think analytically and critically, um, which is something that I feel like for a lot of people, they don't necessarily get that, um, they don't, they're not taught, right, how to sort of think independently for themselves. Um, and that right there sort of will automatically sort of set you back, right, because you'll kind of just take things at, at surface value and not really evaluate deeper. You won't sort of, you know, come to even really question or challenge maybe some of your own beliefs that you don't necessarily know where those things might come from. Um, it really just sort of sets the foundation for, you know, how much sort of bigger or imaginatively you might be able to sort of dream or think. Um, so that's, that's one thing for me. Um, the other thing, which I feel like we've talked about this a lot, but like, they're not just sort of cliches, right? Even though they might sort of be momisms, but there really is something to these ideas of like, you know, comparison is the thief of joy. 
everything in moderation, that, you know, everything is, is rooted and grounded in love and learning, right? And in sort of whatever respect you want to take a look at. Look at. And for me, those are very, um, you know, core sort of um, beliefs and values that I hold that sort of underwrite and underpin everything that I am currently doing in terms of my work, right? Which for anyone who doesn't know, um, it, I'm a, a spiritual practitioner. So I, you know, work a lot with energy and um, really just sort of like focusing on, you know, grounding and taking care of our energetic bodies or our souls, our spirits, however you want to understand it. And then understanding that, you know, in the larger context of our relationships, our work, our life purpose, our environments, um, you know, globally, collectively as well, sort of where directionally we're going with that. I'll go. Um, so right now I'm in a past post baccalaureate pre medical program, and I am trying to become a medical doctor. Um, and so I really love that. Um, I think my desire to want to become a doctor stems from partly because my mom is a medical doctor, and. Um, I also had some stuff going, growing up where doctors really helped me out. So um, I really appreciate that uh, my mom, I can look up to my mom as a medical doctor, as not only um, a medical doctor, but um, also my mom. And um, for uh, right now, I am doing um, a program uh, for shadowing, for pre meds that are shadowing doctors. And they're, my program is specifically for black doctors, whether they're male or female. And I really love this, uh, that I'm doing that and that I'm also learning from other doctors on um, you know, their everyday uh, routines and you know, what it's like, their process of becoming a doctor and um, what, you know, what has really shaped them to the, be the doctor that they are today. Um, and yeah, I'm just going on this uh, pre-medical journey right now, and that's my uh, projected career. And I also have a YouTube channel uh, where it was, uh, at first, I really like baby names. It's kind of a weird quirk that I have, um, but I really like baby names. So I was uh, um, discussing different baby names for uh, uh, expecting mothers and parents. And, you know, even if they wanted to name their pets some, a certain name or their Sims. Um, and then um, I changed gear to, uh, change gears on the YouTube channel to say that, you know, talk about my faith because my faith is really important to me. And uh, so I talk. I have a couple of videos up there talking about my faith, talking about my testimony, talking about um, you know uh, the relationship that I have with Jesus. And so those are the points where I am at today. Um, I'm a little bit late in my medical journey, but everybody's road to medicine is not the same. And I really think it's important that people know that, you know, you don't have to just go straight from college to medical school. There can be a gap in between and you can still be successful in your um, journey to medicine. So yeah, that's my, what I'm doing right now. Yeah, so like Kumara, I entered uh, education. I, um, I have a master's degree in education. I currently work in the nonprofit. My nine to five is in the nonprofit world. Um, but I think, you know, some of the things that we've talked about, um, you know, I'm sort of like reflecting on, uh, I, I have a company called um, Parent with Clarity. It, it used to be Parent Epiphany. And I think it was a little too, um, a too of an innovative name for some people. So, um, Parent Epiphany is a mem membership program currently, but Parent with Clarity really is about giving parents tools, right, so that they feel good about their parenting style. And so it goes back to this, you know, everyone is unique. Do not compare yourself to other people. 
Um, I think, especially with social media, there is a tendency to believe that, you know, people's lives appear to be better than what they are. I'm not saying that everyone is not living their best life. It certainly is possible that a lot of people that you follow on social media are truly living their best life. Um, but I think other people are putting up a facade and you should be more concerned with what you're doing, what works best for your family. You know, oftentimes I see all these things, you know, oh, you know, if you follow this strategy, one, you know, steps one through five, you know, you'll get these results. And it just isn't the case. That's not necessarily how life works. Um, it's worked for that person. I think you can take certain things and, uh, and apply them. But uh, just because a parenting style works for someone else doesn't mean it works for you and your family because of your unique needs. Um, and so Parent with Clarity really is about sort of this, you know, innovative aspect, right? I think as a society, we put a lot of pressure on moms, on parents to be a certain way that they need to live into this perfect ideal. And as it's becoming more clear with COVID-19, uh, it's just, it's not sustainable. Um, it's not sustainable to have an, a nine to five job and take care of your children at the same time. If those are your two things, it's very hard to do if you don't have help. I know I'm living it currently. It's very difficult. And to have this other business too. If there's not, you know, we always say there's not enough hours in the day. It's true. Um, but there are things that you can do to make yourself not feel bad about the things that you are doing, right? I talk with many parents about the loads of laundry that literally need to be folded. And it's okay. We'll find time to do it later. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be now. And so um you know, my parent with Epiphany is, is really about, uh, or parent with clarity, excuse me, is about, um, it's about pregnancy, it's about postpartum, it's about parenthood, it's about exploring all those different stages, because they're all as important. I see a lot of childbirth classes. I don't see postpartum classes out there. Postpartum is probably one of the most difficult times in your life as a new parent. Um, you're sleep deprived, you have this new being in your life that you're not really quite sure what to do. Um, and it comes with a lot of um, a lot of learning curves, right? Like, when am I going to shower? I mean, that becomes like a very basic question as a new parent, <laughs> like, when am I going to find time to shower? And so part of my goal is to help parents realize like you can find the time, you have to be innovative and creative. Um, but there's support, not just for pregnancy, there's support for postpartum, there's support for early parenthood. It's hard. It's especially hard um, during COVID-19. And so, you know, as um, education has always been important to me, innovation has always been important to me. I touched upon imagination. I feel like uh, especially times like now, it's really important to think about creatively what we can do to support ourselves and one another. And that's how I am currently expressing myself um, in helping others. Mm -hmm. So my hope is that uh, through, through this company, through this coaching, through this innovative program for parents, that you're able to feel good about the way that you've chosen to parent, the way that you've chosen to do your postpartum, um, and that you have the resources and the knowledge to apply them to your life in your unique situation. Um, so that's what I'm doing. And honestly, I think at the end of the day, it's all routed back to my, 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 you know, growing up our family and those core things that we've talked about. Um, so there, that's what I'm doing right now. Yeah. Well, um, I'm not going to dwell on my professional career, um, which uh, I practiced uh, maternal fetal medicine um, as a hospital-based physician. So I don't consider myself much of an entrepreneur, although my daughter did point out that I have done some things. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about one of my passions, which is teapots. Um, I'm an avid tea drinker and I collect teapots. Now that's a hobby that actually has evolved into a number of things that have been extremely rewarding. 
One is that I've written a book. So as a result of having this collection of teapots and cataloging them, um, a book called Teapots by Design, a collector's catalog has been published and is available out there. In addition to that, I had a case at our local antique center in Morristown many years ago. Um, as a result of this, I've had um, a teapot exhibit at a local museum. I've done multiple lectures, many of them for nonprofits. Um, I have also uh, this year, actually the first year coming up, my teapots are in the collectible teapot calendar for 2021. Uh, and so um, I've taken this hobby and actually done some things that are that are quite rewarding. Um, they haven't been major money makers, but they've been uh, they've brought pleasure to me. And I think there clearly is something to be said for that. Um, there's certainly nothing like uh, talking about my collection and sharing tea with uh, my family and with friends. I have tea every day, and if I had my druthers we would have afternoon tea in this country every single afternoon. Everybody would take a break and have afternoon tea. Love that, love that. Um, and we all have partaken and love tea as well. We are definitely a tea drinking family yes. and that definitely comes down <laughs> the line. Um, and our grandmother was also a tea yes. drinker. So something that we all do um, and share across generations, which is really exciting. So, um, we have not done a lot of what has happened in 2020. I mean, we talked about the Zoom and obviously we've alluded to the pandemic. So in the interest of self-knowledge, of education, of being retrospective and reflective to everyone here, what is something that you learned about yourself yeah, during these last 10 months or so of the pandemic? I love this question and um, it's been on my mind since earlier in the discussion, right? When we were talking about um, sort of contextualizing the holidays in, in the context of COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter and all that stuff. So um, I think what, like, because one thing that I've, I, I think has happened, right, is that what we were saying earlier in terms of distinguishing between, you know, the material import as opposed to, you know, much like the, you know, spiritual and emotional um, and sort of, you know, less material aspects of the holidays. I think this year has definitely, um, at least for me and I think for many other people, really um you know, hit that, hit that nail on the head in terms of really identifying for me what is important, who and what do I hold dear, um, where do I really truly want to invest my time and my attention and my energy, you know, into things and into people that I really love and that I really cherish, um, and that everything else is really just kind of ancillary to that. Um, so, yeah. Um, I learned that I'm actually really resilient and persistent, not only because um, I believe I'm resilient because I am in a post-bac program, a post-bac pre-med program, like I mentioned earlier, and um, I, it has been actually pretty difficult for me, and a lot of people don't talk about the, their difficulties um, in life in general, but it's, it's been really difficult for me, just the classes. And I actually finished Organic Chem 2 this summer, and it's something that I thought at one point that I wouldn't be able to get through. So um, that I'm really proud of myself for that. And um, I also think I'm resilient because, um, basically, like, I, I, I'm really thankful for my parents for helping me and and everything. So I, um, I, um, sorry. Um, no, I, I think I'm really resilient, and um, I also believe I'm really persistent because I feel like a lot of people would have given up by now on their uh, dreams to becoming a doctor, and um, I think that. Um, I'm really proud of myself for that. And yeah, so that's. Um, sorry, my kids are nearby in case you hear them. But um, I think for me, it's just been about self-forgiveness. Um, you know, this 
2020 has been difficult for a lot of parents, um, myself included. And I think, you know, sometimes we get stuck in like it needs to be this way or, um, you know, or I'm not really sure what happens, but right. We have this sort of ideal on um, how things should work or what they should look like. And so for me, 2020 has just been about, um, like forgiving myself for, for not looking the way that maybe I thought it would, um, you know, Kamar had a session on parenting and one of the things that I, um, had recently forgiven myself during that talk was I was still breastfeeding my daughter. I had envisioned that I would, you know, stop breastfeeding her uh, close to a year after, um, when that just wasn't the case, we were like physically very close. Like normally she would have been in daycare. And so it would have been a little bit easier to wean her off. And I breastfed her for much longer than I had wanted to, than I had expected. And so I think just like forgiving myself for that, right. It might seem um, really minute or not as important to other people, but for me, it was very, it was very difficult situation. And so just like the self forgiveness, or again, you know, I referenced laundry, like, I have forgiven myself for not having all the laundry folded. Like that happened a long time ago. Like I just need to, you know, forgive myself for the house, the way that it might not look perfect. Like it's okay. Um, and I think sometimes it's really hard again, when you sort of think about either other people or what people might expect from you, right? Like their expectation on what your house should look like. And it doesn't look like that. Um, and for just to be okay with what it is. Um, so that's my, my biggest takeaway in my self learning is to is self forgiveness. And that will probably continue in the new year. <laughs> Great. Well, I hope all these learnings continue in the new year ingrained in all of us. Um, so for me, which I think sounds counterintuitive because whenever I say this to people, they're like, huh, what are you talking about? But I'm definitely getting out of my comfort zone. I actually, probably contrary to popular opinion, I'm a pretty private person. I really don't like to put myself out there. Um, I'm very rarely on social media. <laughs> um, so this year I decided to, to totally get out of my comfort zone and to stretch that. And what I've learned is the amount of love, community, and support that people really want. Um, and love and, and love and support that I, I have for me. So, you know, I think if you guys have been following, you know that um, way back in the beginning of, I guess it was the end of the spring or the beginning of the summer, you know, we were maliciously Zoom bomb mm -hmm. attacked. And so, um, you know, <laughs> that was it was not a good time. And then I decided, let's just, let's just be loud about it. Let's just publicize this. But the thing that I most remember is the community really rallying against uh, behind me. Like my sister sent me a beautiful um, gift of flowers and I had friends who sent me plants and I had people who were sending me love and cards. And I just, I just didn't know that, I mean, I knew that I had friends who loved me. I mean, I'm not saying that, but I just didn't realize that um, I had such an outpouring of love and community. And um, it's just, it's just beautiful to see all of that happening. Cause I think sometimes at least for me, I can be my own head. <laughs> I can be my own space. It's difficult out here fighting. Um, it's emotionally draining. And so oftentimes I actually feel quite alone. And so that was really a moment where I realized I'm not alone. So I wanted to thank all of you all, uh, of course my sisters, my mother, but all of you all who are who have been supportive of, of all the things um, that I've been doing. So that's been, those have been my aha moments during the pandemic. Huh? Yes, I'm going to answer it on two levels, and one actually is just the opposite of Kumar. I think one of the things I learned about myself is, well, I know I didn't learn this. I am a very social person, and it is extremely difficult for me not to be able to travel and to visit new places and to visit family and friends. That has been just so hard for me. So even though we've maintained our connection, through Zoom and other types of media, I just, it is, I can't wait to be able to really travel again. And one of the reasons is, again, sharing time and seeing family and friends, but also traveling to new places and learning new things. We always talk about the importance of continuing to learn. And that's one of the best ways to learn about other cultures, how the people live and what's going on in different countries. Now, on the other side of that, 
and again, this is not something that I learned, but I think one of the important things that came out uh, during the pandemic, and we had a session earlier on healthcare and the disparities. So one of the major things that this pandemic has revealed is the extreme, has amplified the disparities that exist between black and white America in terms of health and in terms of um, wealth. Uh, and those are things that we definitely need to continue to address and to discuss and to try to get to the root causes of those things and do something about them. This is not new. We've been talking about this for ages. I've actually been on a committee uh, in New Jersey since the late 80s, looking at maternal mortality in particular and looking at the disparities. This, this is not new. We talk about it, we give it lip service, but we really have not addressed the root causes of all of these things that lead to the disparities in health and wealth and in our criminal justice system. This is a great segue for um, a staple for all of my shows, which is self-care. Mm -hmm. And um, my mother loves, <laughs> anytime the self-care portion comes out to my show, she is sending me text messages. Don't forget to say this, don't forget to say that. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna let you do the self-care piece last so we can okay. end on all of your great notes. Okay. Um, and why don't we, I'm gonna start with Naima and just go around. So Naima, Tamika, Shrita, then me, then Bob. Okay, so for me, um, I try, well, I just started to play tennis with Komara um, about three to four times a week. So that's how I started to get my exercise in. Um, I also try to drink um, green juice um, every once in a while just to get my greens in uh, if I'm not consuming them by eating them. Uh, um, and I also try to drink green tea or black tea without sugar. Um, and that's something that I do by myself. I do that with my mom, my sisters. Uh, drinking tea is a big thing in our family. Um, I also um, joined a book club and we're reading The Queen's Gambit. So uh, for a, a while I hadn't uh, been reading for my personal development or for my own pleasure. So I decided to join a book club and I've been enjoying reading, uh, doing my reading. So yeah, that's uh, some ways that I keep on. Per oh, I also, um, I'm a Christian and I, I, when my when I feel like when my mind is all over the place, I just stop and I just pray for a second, and that really helps me to get my mind back on track to uh, go back to gratitude and just to be thankful for what ha God has placed in my life, the, the people that He's placed in my life, and the things. Um, and so I recommend that. If anybody's listening, that you pray to God if you know your mind, your mentality. And I also think that everybody should have some sort of therapist, uh, whether that be a psychologist or a psychiatrist, uh, just somebody that even a mentor that you can talk to and get your feelings out there and uh, really uh, just uh, talk to them about your life and how things are going. It always is good to get a different perspective on uh, your life and the things that you're doing in your life. So I think those are some of the self-care tips that I try to enforce and on my life on a regular basis. And yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, so a few of, I like all those tips. A few of the tips that I might add are um, Definitely gratitude, um, prayer, journaling, meditation, visual visualization. Did I say journaling already? Because uh, that one's definitely a huge one. Um, even a simple gratitude list is like a good, especially I find like if I catch myself kind of in an off mood or thinking negatively, like in order to switch my brain, I'll just jot down a list of things that I'm grateful for right then in that moment. Um, let's see what else creating right whatever that sort of means for you obviously for a lot of people that might involve writing but painting drawing sketching any type of creative activity that you might enjoy um i love taking baths as well um listening to music is a, is a great one um and i will i guess just plug myself a little bit here i do offer self-care 
readings. Um, and right now, Sharita and I actually have a deal going on for anyone who follows Parent with Clarity. You can get a 20% off um, code to get a self-care reading. But that's a really fun card reading that I do that a lot of my clients love because in addition to the the normal card interpretations, each card comes with a specific self-care um, um, prescription. So it's obviously something that it's suggestive. You can do it or not, but it is a lot of fun. So thank you. Yeah. So Tamika touched on this, but yeah, on Instagram, parent with clarity and Facebook, actually, for that matter, I just finished 30 days of self-care. So if you need tips, I got 30 tips for you, plus probably more. Um, because being a parent, honestly, you need to take care of yourself. If you're not taking care of yourself, then it's going to be very difficult for you to take care of your children. So as much as right, we care for our children, you also need to be a priority. So my biggest self-care tip for you um, and what I think self-care ultimately means is taking time for yourself even if that's 10 minutes, 10 minutes of silence, 10 minutes of whatever you want to do, 10 minutes to paint one hand, whatever you want to do, right? Paint your nails, just taking the time for yourself literally can be, um, can change your whole day. So my, my tip to you, and this is why, you know, some people say taking a shower isn't self-care. I say it is because you've taken the time to take care of yourself. And that is what self-care is about. So just take the time uh, to take care of yourself. That is my, that's my tip. And follow Parent with Clarity to get more. Love the plugs, love the plugs. Um, so I, I need to get much better at the self-care, but I will say one of the things that I have absolutely been enjoying is our three to sometimes five days a week of tennis with um, Naima, so I try to play tennis or do something physical every day, and it's helpful to have a buddy who comes along with you to hold you um, accountable. Um, it also gives us some um, social distancing. You get some of that um, interaction, that uh, safe interaction that you can have with folks. Um, the other thing is that um, I love learn. Well, we've all said this. We all love learning. So of course, you know, reading is fundamental. I take time to read almost every day. But on top of that, I also have a bit of a podcast addiction. So I listen to at least one podcast around a particular topic that I may not know much about, um, just to continue to expand my mind. Um, the other thing that I think also has been infused in our family is I love watching Jeopardy. So whenever I get a chance, <laughs> That's like a little moment for us to play, to watch and, 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 and do a little Jeopardy. And the other thing is I try to check in and, and with my friends, right? Um, so I try to check in with my friends weekly or once every couple of weeks, whether that's just a text to say, hey, girl, hey, dude, like, how are you doing? Like, is life okay? Um, and that feels really good because, you know, obviously I'm a person who likes, like my mom, I like to be connected to other people. Um, and you, we don't have the pleasure of being able to see everyone the way that we would like to. So just even sending a little text to let them know that they've been on my mind and, and vice versa has been really helpful for, for this time. And now, mom, last word goes to you. <laughs> okay, so overall, um, I, I just want to stress the importance of just basic preventative health, which a lot of us don't do. We tend to be, as a society, on many, many different levels, including our health care and well-being. We tend to be reactive rather than proactive. And being proactive is so important uh, in terms of our physical uh, and mental wellness. So just to talk about, um, you all have great and excellent suggestions. I'm just gonna tell you what a few of mine are. Um, I love walking. In fact, when I turned 60, one of the things that I vowed to do was to do a half marathon at least, maybe one marathon in one of those years, uh, every one at least uh, for the next 10 years. Kumar and I tend to do them together. And so far we've done five and I'm actually preparing now to do the virtual Miami marathon in January. So I try to get out and walk, if not every day, every other day, and do about five to seven miles. I find it extremely relaxing. Um, I actually don't listen to music while I'm walking. I like to be in tune with what's going on around me. 
I often see various things in nature. I take photos, I do videos. I've actually sent a video to the grandchildren uh, when I see certain things happening while I'm walking. So um, I'm grateful to be living in an area where I can walk all year round. And, uh, and that's one of my passions. But you don't have to spend that much time. You don't have to walk as much as I do. Just a, a short walk helps, your, helps you. Deep breathing, reading as was discussed, um, your spirituality, taking time for prayer, for yoga, for meditation, um, socializing, even in, this, uh, in, in, in light of COVID, this, the way that we're doing it now. But certainly once we can all get back together again, you know, having your core group and being able to socialize is so important. As Sharita mentioned, taking a hot shower or a nice hot bath is just incredible. I call those little mini escapes and me time and I've been doing them for years. Um, and of course, taking tea. Everybody should take time. I mean, if tea isn't your thing, whatever it is, if it's a, a juice or if it's coffee, um, take some time for yourself and you can either reflect over a cup by yourself. You can engage in conversation uh, if you're having a cup with one other person and you can have a real social gathering, hopefully sometime in the near future with a group uh, having your favorite beverage. So uh, just keep in mind that it doesn't cost a lot of money uh, to take time for yourself uh, and to uh, just do things that are going to help you thrive. Great. And with that, that is the end of our program. Um, time, as always, flies by. Thank you guys so much for um, tuning in, watching us. We will be continuing. So we'll be back for a new season in 2021. Uh, Mom, Naima, Sharita, Tamika, thank you all so much. I really appreciate you guys being here. And of course, love you. And thank you for organizing it. Yeah, love everybody. Thank you, Kwamara. Thank, Thank you. Thank you all. Happy New Year.